Uh, Maritza Hernandez has 26 years of professional experience in undergraduate and graduate education, focusing on admissions, financial aid, and student alumni affairs. 18 of them have been here at Harvard University. As a higher education professional, Dean Hernandez has been an advocate for underrepresented students and has focused on strategies to recruit undergraduate and graduate students, as well as focused on retention and programs. Over the last nine years at Harvard Divinity School, Dean Hernandez has focused on recruiting a diverse student body, providing the resources students need to succeed at HDS and beyond, as well as creating experiential learning opportunities outside of the classroom. And as you all know, uh, Maritza Hernandez is the visionary who launched the Diversity and Explorations program. Dean Hernandez successfully led the integration of enrollment and student services, including the Office of Admissions, the Office of Financial Aid, the Office of Student Life, the Office of Career Services, and the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life. She serves as an active member of the Master of Divinity and Master of Theological Studies program committees as well as the Executive Committee on Academic Programs, and this year co-chairs the Standing Committee on Diversity. Maritza Hernandez is a member of the Senior Leadership Team and advises the Dean of the School and the Senior Administration on Policy Matters and Strategic Planning. She holds a Bachelor of Science from Boston University and a Master of Education in Higher Education Administration from Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I'm also proud to call her my mentor, Maritza. Wow, thank you, Prudence. <laughs> um, it's, this is always so exciting for me to be here tonight. Um, uh, this was a, a, a vision, this program was a vision I had um, after my first year here at HDS, um, and you are the eighth cohort um, of that vision. And, you know, it's, I always find it um, moving and exciting and look forward to um, you visiting and getting to know you and seeing you take advantage of um, all that HDS has to offer. As you decide and discern um, if graduate, if, your divinity schools, the path, um, graduate education, Harvard University. Um, and so I'm thrilled that we were able to provide uh, this opportunity for, for all of you. And so I hope that you are really taking advantage of today. Yesterday, we still have um, tomorrow um, as you, know, you learn and, and, and take it all in. Um, as you know, I, and I've been talking to all of you, and, and it sounds like um, you've are really taking advantage of everything and, and really getting a lot out of it. Um, and one of the things that I always like to share is because we're not able to invite everyone that applies to the program. Um, we wish we could. Um, the dean generously um, supports this program so strongly that he even um, gave us additional funding to increase the number so that we can invite more. Um, but still, we have more applications than um, spots. and so. Our, our hope is that you will take what you learn here, um, because the, the goal of the program is um, multifold. Um, it, it's to attract students that would be terrific here, that would enrich the program, that would enrich our classrooms, our community, um, but that would generally uh, self-select out because of the Harvard name. Um, so that's the demystifying Harvard, um, but also um, the, the name Divinity School. Um, I, as you think of, uh, people think of Divinity School as we travel as, um, and talk about HDS, people th have very, um, kind of very narrow view, very traditional view of what a Divinity School is. And it's hard for us to convey um, all that is happening here and all that we, um, that our faculty are doing, that our students are doing. And so we feel like the best way to do it is to bring you here and have you experience it for yourselves. Um, and so our hope is that as you're doing that and, uh, and taking this, and when you go back to your schools, to your communities, um, that you will share what you have learned here. 
um, with friends, with colleagues, um, with people that are interested uh, in learning more about us. Um, I, I've spoken to a number of you who had who heard it from others, so it's paying off, uh, word of mouth. Um, many of you said, oh yeah, I heard it from a friend that participated and told me. So um, that's the charge uh, for you that I, I give you, that um, to go back home and, and share um, all that you've learned here and uh, about Harvard and about the Divinity School. I'm also proud that um, in a, you know, being the eighth cohort, sort of to, to give you a little bit of information about the alums, that, that are DivX alums who have um, come to our degree programs and has since graduated and have moved on to wonderful careers um, in higher education administration. Um, they're community organizers. They've started businesses and consulting firms. Um, they work as chaplains in hospitals and hospice. Um, they're foreign affair officers in the State Department. Uh, they uh, teach at the middle, middle school and high school um, levels, both in public and private uh, schools. Um, they're ordained ministers, uh, religious leaders, uh, making a difference, working within their own tradition, but also doing interfaith work. Um, they're in doctoral programs, studying religion, um, African and African American studies. Um, and you'll hear from some of them. We invite some of our uh, alums to come and share with you. Some of them will be DIVEX alums, uh, not all of them. Um, and so you'll hear tomorrow um, from our wonderful uh, alumni and the things that they're doing. And uh, many are also enrolled in professional schools pr pursuing MBAs and law degrees. Um, so there is exciting for me to see um, how they've changed the face of HDS. They've enriched our community in many ways, but that they've also have taken the education here and are, are making a difference um, in their fields um, and in their communities. And so it, it's it's a wonderful legacy that I'm really proud of. So. Thank you for being here. Thank you for participating. Um, thank you to the admission staff because this is a lot of work. Um, and they spend months um, preparing for this. And so um, it always goes off beautifully. So I want to thank them all, um, as well as our student volunteers that we couldn't do this without. Uh, uh, some of them are here, um, others are, are not. But You've seen them throughout the, the day. You'll continue to see them. We just have a terrific team, and so I want to thank all of them. But so without much further ado, I am going to uh, now present, uh, introduce our faculty speaker. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a colleague and uh, someone that I not consider a friend, um, Professor Mayra Rivera Rivera. Um, she joined Harvard Divinity School faculty in July 2010. Her transdisciplinary work in critical theological studies engages key Christian themes in, rela uh, in relation to current theory and philosophy. She's also affiliated with the Department of Romance Languages and Literature Literatures at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Her book, The Touch of Transcendence, A Postcolonial Theology of God, published in 2007, which I've heard great things from our students, they love that book when they read it, um, explores the relationship between models of divine otherness and ideas about interhuman difference. She's also co-editor with Stephen Moore of Planetary Loves, Spivak, Postcolonial, Colonial, this is where my accent comes out, and certain words I just can't say. I think it's both colonial and theology, published in 2010. And um, with Catherine Keller and Michael Nosner of Postcolonial Theology's Divinity and uh, Empire, published in 2004. Her most recent book, uh, Poetics of the Flesh, explores the connections between theological, philosophical, and political metaphors of body and flesh. Um, this book is um, due to be published next fall, uh, 2015. And so the title of her talk is Practical Commitments, The Ethics of Critical Education. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Rivera.
Let me switch eyeglasses here. <laughs> It is such a joy to welcome you all to Harvard Divinity School. It's great to see you all in this room and to see you walking around and to have the great conversations we've been having and we'll keep having. And thank you, Maritza and Prudence, uh, for inviting me to speak tonight. And I'm also grateful to the Divinity School for the commitment to this important program that just um, brings so much to our campus. As, as soon as I received the invitation to speak to you, I started to imagine this moment, looking at you here, and I wondered what I could add to the rich conversations I knew you already had had. No, no doubt by now your heads are full of wonderful ideas and your stomachs are full of wonderful food. And I should probably just skip the talk and go straight to the questions. Um, but thinking about what you might be pondering at this moment as you consider the possibility of applying to a graduate school program at the Divinity School, I remembered my own questions when I faced that decision. And I can tell you it was not an easy decision. Why pursue graduate studies? Or why pursue graduate studies in religion, in theology, instead of a degree in engineering, or environmental science, perhaps? Why not something more practical? <laughs> and my friends dutifully informed me that Latinas are practical people. So they thought, and they were re deeply troubled. Maybe I was confused. <laughs> and in many ways, I was confused. <laughs> and I suspect many of you are familiar with the picture. But I realized that there was something wrong with the question itself. Yes, I have learned, and especially from the students at HDS, the wide variety of things people do with a graduate degree in theological studies. I have had the privilege to work with teachers, artists, politicians, scientists, ministers, etc., who integrate what they learn at the Divinity School into what they do in such creative ways. So I always learn from them. But today I want to talk to you first about how a critical education complicates the question of what is practical learning. How it forced me to reassess what is at stake in the common questions and assumptions about our practical commitments. And second, I will talk about how these inform the study of theology at HDS. So let me share with you an example from research I did a long time ago. It was particularly significant for me, although I'm afraid it wasn't the best <laughs> research. Um, it changed me and has changed my view of education. I was studying uh, discourses of the Protestant missionaries in Puerto Rico following the U.S. invasion of the island in 1898. The focus of the project was on how American missionaries had represented Puerto Ricans, how this representation of the people helped them justify their arguments for the need to convert them from Catholicism, and how the conversion was in turn 
part of a broader project to Americanize Puerto Rico, which is never succeeded. <laughs> um, as you can hear from my <laughs> when when I undertook that project, working in dusty archives, reading pamphlets and missionary reports, and looking at old pictures, I did not realize the broader significance of this quest. For my family in Puerto Rico, and even for myself, I was just doing what a weird academic does, just getting lost in paper. <laughs> it did not seem practical, really. It was only years later that I began to realize that the scholar that I became, not a historian, by the way, was being born in the process of that quest. I should have known this, because one of the thinkers who had inspired me was Edward Said, a Palestinian literary critic and public intellectual known for his contribution to post-colonial theory. In the opening of his groundbreaking book, Orientalism, Said explains what drove him to write the book. As I was asked just a minute ago, what inspired you? Um, and he offered three motivations for it. I will only mention the third one, the personal dimension of the book. Said explains that this, this dimension, the personal dimension, by citing Marxist thinker Antonio Gramsci. And he states, I'm quoting Said here, the starting point of a critical work is the consciousness of what one really is. This is how he begins. The suggestion to know oneself may sound rather common, perhaps a bit narcissistic, but he's moving towards something much more complex, toward an ethical view. He says, you should know thy, knowing thyself as a product of, a, of historical processes to date. Those historical processes have deposited in you an infinity of traces but they have left no inventory. Therefore, the task of the critic is at the outset to compile such an inventory. So Said studied how Western forms of knowledge constructed non-Western societies. And he understood this work as much more than a historical excavation, much more than a turn to the past. He saw it as an attempt to compile an inventory of the traces that those cultures had left in him, in his education, and in his knowledge. Having read Said, I should have known what I understood later that researching this history of U.S. Pro Protestantism in Puerto Rico, exploring how it represented those who lived a century before, I too was attempting to compile an inventory of the traces that history had left in my own education. Let me be clear here. Compiling an inventory of historical traces is not explaining a life. Explanations end the process of questioning. They conclude. In contrast, following traces opens up to questioning what one assumed was clear, definitive, and complete. What the process then was helping me see was how much of my knowledge, my questions, my presuppositions 
were part of a broader history that demanded my critical attention. This history was social, was political, was familial, was religious, and all at the same time. This implies that knowledge is complicated by all the factors that shape a society. And in this case, it meant that prevailing notions of what is good education were entangled in those processes as well. The project of conversion of Puerto Ricans entail, I feel so strange saying Puerto Ricans, <laughs> Puerto Ricans, um, entailed restructuring the system of education. This is part of the larger project. History texts were rapidly rewritten and there were attempts, failed attempts, to change the language of public education to English. And all this is typical of colonial processes, as I had learned by then. What was surprising still for me was finding arguments not only for changing what was taught in schools, but also for limiting the level of education. There were policies to limit education of the natives to high school and to focus on practical subjects like mathematics and science. The justification for that policy was that Puerto Ricans were too inclined to philosophize, to engage in abstract forms of thinking. They argued that they were not practical. And industries needed practical people. I have to say, sharing this story um, in different places, I have found so many similar stories in the Philippines and also in the United States in relation to African Americans, the appeal to make, making them practical. Um, and there is a logic to this argument. The interest was in forming a population for specific economic tasks in society. But also, and I think it's safe to assume, to avoid the kind of critical analysis that would question the logic of the whole system. This is an old story, I know, but how could I not be shocked by it when I had been told that Latinos were naturally more practical? Probably, I would have never learned about this history if I had accepted that I was supposed to do more practical things. I was doing what others considered impractical. And that taught me not to take statements about practical commitments at face value, but instead to ask questions. Who is being told to be practical? For what? And what is at stake in such decisions? This logic has not disappeared. It might be even more pervasive today than it was in 1898. We read constantly in the media about the merits of more practical areas of education. And the concerns are understandable. When financial situations are dire, we may need to give more attention to immediate needs, no question. There are hard choices that some of our parents and grandparents had to make. And in many ways, we owe them the possibility of gathering here today. But what will we do with these possibilities that are open up for us? Now, let me assure you that I am not advocating for impractical education. <laughs> to the contrary, I am encouraging you to analyze what might be hiding behind the appeal to the practical, or perhaps more importantly, to think about the practical in more capacious ways, more broadly, 
such a view of the practical would not determine what we need to know beforehand, what information we will possess at the end of the day. For at the end of the day, the questions might have changed. It will instead be the kind of education that, op that is open-ended, that help us be more attentive, critical, the kind of education that transforms us in the process. This is what a first generation of Latin American liberation theologians had in mind when they turned to the work of Paulo Freire, who developed models of critical education that guided participants to develop the skills to see, judge, and act, and see again, and judge again, and act again. Now that is practical, a practical commitment for life. So how do these commitments relate specifically to the study of religion, to the study of theology, to a degree at HDS? An immediate response would be that religious histories have left traces in us, and that as thinkers, teachers, activists, we have a responsibility for investigating how they shape our views of the communities and the views of the communities to which we relate personally and professionally. Furthermore, in contrary to what previous generations may have imagined and modern scholars proclaimed, religious communities have not disappeared and they continue to influence society. The most common examples given for this are global conflict and political debate, in both of which appeals to religious identities are explicit. In the, if this is the case, then anybody who wants to understand the practices of contemporary societies and perhaps persuade those who identify as religious must learn about the histories, challenge, challenges, and commitments that animate religious communities, about their institutions, demographic, internal conflicts, etc. In the case of the missionaries in Puerto Rico, is the, the case, that case is one example of this very connection. Understanding the textures and the rhythms of Christianity in Puerto Rico and of the Puerto Rican communities in the United States requires understanding the history of political relations between Spain, the United States, and Puerto Rico the influence of African traditions in constructions of national and religious identities, and many more, many, many other aspects of life in, in the island and its history. And more generally, world peace and the flourishing of communities around the globe require that some people who have the necessary skills and the opportunity undertake the slow process of critical education to learn, to see, to judge, and to act in the world. This is an ethical task, and in, me, in my opinion, it is enough to justify getting a, a graduate degree in theology or religion. Yet, when I think about the study of theology, I tend to think not only about how religious ideas appear in political debates and social conflicts, but also about how they guide human beings seeking to live ethical and meaningful lives. How it guides people as they interpret and transforms the realities of their personal and communal situations. Thus, religion is not something we study in order to understand something else, another issue, 
like social conflict, but rather a crucial element in all aspects of human existence. So at HDS, we seek substantial, rigorous knowledge about traditions, how they emerge and evolve, how they are interpreted by those who found them authoritative and compelling, what ideas, stories, and practices people turn to when they address specific problems, suffering, injustice, identity, morality. We study histories of communities and social movements, the evolution of ideas and practices. We study texts used for different purposes and written in different genres, stories, songs, myths, poems, and instructions. We engage closely philosophical questions implicit and articulated through religious ideas. What is the purpose of life? What is a human being? How important are race, gender, culture, or sexuality for a person's humanity? What distinguishes a human being from the non-human? Thus, at HDS, we do not seek to separate what we do from other areas of study. We do not have to choose between the dusty archive and the communal meeting, between careful intellectual questions and commitments to the societies in which we live. Instead, we try to understand the relationship between those. The, distinct, the distinctiveness of our work here derives not from its separation, but rather from its relations. Rather than, than taking for granted our commitments, we open them to critical scrutiny in relation to the worlds that shape us. Knowing ourselves is part of historical processes that have left traces in us is a necessary step toward engaging a world ethically and effectively. We step back and imagine a different future. Thank you. And I'll pass the mic around, so we have one here. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for being here and for talking to us. Um, I've been thinking about um, coming here, how I feel like I'm between the old and the new in my ways of thinking and in the narratives I always thought defined me. And, um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about risk mm -hmm. and how it's a risk to come here and to kind of, in your undergrad, you kind of go through a lot of transformation and become unmoored and then reform. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was thinking about how that's going to happen again. <laughs> and I don't know what's going to come out at the end. Uh -huh. um, I was wondering if you could apply how you thought about the question of practical mm -hmm. to the this notion of risk, like mm -hmm. what's behind my <laughs> thinking of risk? Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, the it, it, the huge the the risk is huge um, because we we are facing an education that changes us, right? Um, and and part of what I was trying to convey is that the that that is what true education looks like. That, that we, we endeavor to understand not only the world, but understand ourselves as part of the world that we study. Um, and not only is that um, 
a, a deeper way of knowledge, it's also an ethical way of knowledge where we recognize our own implications in, in the process, in the process of learning and in the process of seeking transformation in any of the ways in which we do. Um, so the, the risks are, are always there mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, one of the things we learn through graduate education is to continue learning, to develop habits and practices that continue to challenge us through life. Hello, um, sure. my name is Kerwin, uh, and uh, thank you for this talk as well. Um, I actually um, went to uh, a course at Morehouse and a guest speaker came in um, from Cali, and he said, uh, basically, theology begins at the question. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really the, the art of questioning mm -hmm. um, what, what we, mm -hmm. our current reality and our situation. Mm -hmm. um, and he was speaking about, specifically in the relationship of, of theology and pain, but he mm -hmm. said it just, mm -hmm. as a norm, the, mm -hmm. the question is what engages theology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my question for you, I guess, for the HDS program, I've seen that uh, questioning is, is something of a bit of a norm in all the classes I've been through. Like, they've been <laughs> questioning everything, um, and it's been fun. Except uh, the, the professors, you don't question the professors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, my, my big uh, question, I guess, mm -hmm. for this environment of questioning is, is there a space for, um, for those who, uh, say, aren't, on the curve of uh, being uh, as uh, free thinking in, in some traditions mm -hmm. as, as, as others are, mm -hmm. is there, a, is there a, a vein of questioning for um, why that is? Mm -hmm. A vein of questioning for um, like why should we consider some things um, sacred mm -hmm. or orthodox mm -hmm. so much to hold them as mm -hmm. being consistent mm -hmm. to reality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good question and it offers me uh, an opportunity to clarify um, two things. The, you know, the, the process of questioning can be one that takes us deeper into our own traditions, right? Um, to understand it more deeply, um, to try to, to get at what, what is still moving without, within, within traditions, right? Um, and, and the same for critical. Uh, when I, when I um, use the term critical is not to imply that all we do is criticize. Uh, to the country is, is precisely to take the risk to invest ourselves in the study of something um, as deeply as we possibly can um, without determining beforehand where we're going to end, right? Um, and, and in many ways, the, we'll find uh, that, that the traditions we, we study, the religious traditions that we study, have uh, resources that encourage that kind of questioning, especially when we're talking about theological traditions, right? Um, that that, that one, of the, one of the greatest fears of many uh, religious traditions is that that tendency we have to objectify things, right? To close them up, to make them uh, objects um, that don't speak anymore. Uh, so even in, a, in in the study of of our own traditions, we find the the resources, we find that interest uh, in keeping traditions alive, precisely by questioning, precisely by studying, precisely by going deeper into that kind of knowledge. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. Um, I guess I had a question about doing work that is situated to your identity or identities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's, you know, at least in my little experience, it, um, can be, I guess, at the least terrifying and the most really traumatizing mm -hmm. to sort of be mm -hmm. unlearning things about a collective history that you share with a certain group of people. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how to sort of deal with the possibility of encountering that trauma or that terror mm -hmm. in, in doing sort of critical work surrounding mm -hmm. identities. 
right, right after I, I published the, the article about which I was speaking, a, a colleague of mine who was also from Puerto Rico told me he never writes about Puerto Rico because it makes him angry. Um, and and I, I think that the, 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 the question of how the, the locations from which one speaks are, are complex questions. Um, and, and I don't have a prescription that applies to, to all, right? And um, I, was, I was saying at the table before that sometimes our, our projects call us in particular ways, right? At a moment, it might, be, it might call us to, to speak from the perspective of someone who's just immigrated into the United States. At, at another point, it, it, it calls us to, to speak from the perspective of someone who's seen violence in a neighborhood. Um, and the, the, I think the, the particular um, interest for me in, 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 in bringing this example was how, how it helped me uh, think precisely, rethink about how identities had been constructed, right? How to, to understand the processes by which those identities were constructed. And in, in this particular case, uh, it was actually a liberating um, process to, to understand the, 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 the realities of of the of the movements in 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 Puerto Rico against uh, the the definition of certain identities and the limitations of education, the limitations of languages, uh, and so so there's there there's pain and and also resources um, in the courage of others who've who've preceded us. I have a question over here. Was there? Someone over here, but okay, then I'll just make my way through here. Excuse me. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> I'm sorry, mics are really strange. <laughs> um, so this kind of gets at the identity question as well. Um, and your speech kind of strikes me because I'm also Puerto Rican, but I don't really sound it. And this is something that I think about very frequently um, in terms of entering higher education. Um, I, I love the critical thinkers. Like, I, I love the Germans. They're, they're great. Um, really strange. I'm, I'm in my second year of German language instruction now, and I'm totally enamored by the philosophy of like critical questioning and that's kind of my deal, text and criticism. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think a lot about the phrase sellout, and I think a lot in terms of my Puerto Rican heritage and how um, I don't really know Spanish, mm -hmm. but I'm learning German, and I'm learning German so that I can critically question mm -hmm. my oppressor, who may mm -hmm. in fact be German. <laughs> Not that the German specifically had anything to do with Puerto Rico, but... Mm -hmm. um, uh, the West more generally, if we want to accept Saeed's terminology. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was wondering how you might reconcile a graduate level education and what I might tell people in the Bronx when I come back and I sound completely different because I'm mm -hmm. speaking in terms of structural oppression, which has many syllables and mm -hmm. all sorts of things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think I think the the there are two the two parts of your question if I understood it correctly. Um, one of the questions is about the the sources with which we speak and and how they relate to how we construct our own identities. Um, and, and in relation to that to the question I would say the that that's also something that that changes through time, and the connections are, are sometimes um, unexpected. I could say, well, there's, um, there was a lot of dialogue between Latin American liberation theologians and the Fra Frankfurt School, for example, um, and that dialogue back and forth. So, so you might be surprised to find many who share your interests and have found it quite relevant to ask questions 
about um, their own identities as, as Puerto Ricans, as, as, as Latinos, as Latin Americans. Uh, um, and, and, and again, the, 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 what, one of the things that drive us all um, is a, is a um, longing for knowledge, right? Um, and, and sometimes that longing takes us in, into various unexpected places. Uh, and the, the, so, so I, I'm, I'm saying, learn it well. Um, and, and, and be open to the, to the questions that arise from it to, to, that, that speak to your own life. And, and I mean it when I say very often our, our, our projects, our intellectual projects, kind of call us. Um, and, and you follow, and, and perhaps like, like the example I was giving you, many years later you realize what you are doing <laughs> um, and, and the significance that it had in, in your life. Um, the question of how do we speak back um, in, in our communities of origin, um, we become multilingual. Um, and I think it's always a challenge. Uh, it's always a challenge to move between worlds, but it's also a source of a lot of wisdom, right? Uh, one learns about different uh, epistemologies, different ways of knowing, different ways of speaking, um, and, and, and learns also to be attentive uh, to how one speaks in, in different contexts, how one teaches, uh, how, how one listens, how one, it's challenge uh, for, from, from every, every place. And, and that's like the question of the risk, that's another one that never quite goes away. Uh, you keep uh, translating and learning Okay. Hi there. Um, so, so right now, um, I totally it totally re uh, resonates with me this notion of having quests, different quests with no permanent um, end goals, and that questioning, kind of critical questioning, is is the movement on our quest, and that that's definitely been a lived experience for me. But I've also experienced that sometimes when I question. I tend to become stuck, or I tend to be taken away from the present moment. And maybe those are the questions that aren't critical enough, but I have struggling, I'm struggling balancing questioning that keeps me stuck and questioning that keeps me moving. And I wanted to know if you had any advice on that. There's a um, Latin American liberation theologian who, who once, once said, we often talk about change and change and change, um, but we, we want to, to we were looking for differences that make a difference. Um, so the, so the, the, the and, and of course we, we do not always know that ahead of time, right? Um, but, but, but part of what we are searching is, is in relation to the communities uh, in which we live. So what, what, I, what is needed? What, what, what are things that are perhaps obstacles? In, in those communities? What are areas of questioning that might open doors for others? What are things that are um, really limiting our, our abilities to relate to different communities, to relate to our own knowledge, to relate to, to the lives of others? So I think you're, you're right. There's um, the, it, it's not asking questions for the sake of, of, of questioning, but there's a deeper commitment um, that, uh, that for me is an ethical commitment that, that drives what kinds of questions I, I ask, what, where do I um, invest energy and time. Um, and these are ethical questions. There could be um, questions about beauty and joy also, uh, which are often also part of, of ethical questions, right? What drives us, what, what's beautiful, what fuels life. Okay. I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, hi. Oh, hi. gosh. Uh, my name is Ashley. Um, thanks for speaking tonight. Uh, my question relates more to, I feel like you just gave us this great talk on like the art of questioning. Um, and my dad always says being skeptical is like one of the greatest gifts. Um, and you speaking like definitely reiterated that to me. Um, but I fear, especially with today's society that we grow up in, um, that the importance of humanities and liberal arts and this art of questioning is being lost. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely feel like I can't have much conversations with people because everyone just wants a direct answer mm -hmm. and just wants to get straight to the point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're right. Like That misses the whole point of maybe the end result isn't the answer, but just to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know like, what your advice would be going forth in a world that um, may not stress the importance of liberal arts or so much more humanities. Can I can I stole Prudence line and say, well, let's start a movement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the the but but I say that quite seriously, that a commitment to to education is part of of our contribution um, to assert the, that value in society. And I think um, we, it's not hard to see how important it is um, for, for all citizens, I would say, to, to spend time learning um, critically, right? Um, and and so, so, so I invite you to, um, to accept uh, the challenge and to not only learn um, the the learn it for your own education, but also learn how to teach others um, and how to convey the importance of of, uh, of religion, um, the importance of the humanities. It is the I I I am part of the of the board of the American Academy of Religion, and one of the things that we we've been talking about a lot is how important it is for us scholars of religion to also speak for the humanities, to also speak for the values that they represent in the United States, to not, get, to not let that die out. Um, and part of it is, is, is learning and participating in the processes. Do we have a question? Oh. Thank you so much again for being here and for the talk that you gave. Uh, and I have a question for you. What I find as I matriculate through my undergraduate experience is that oftentimes I'm vacillating between cynicism and optimism when I become exposed to so much information. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, how do you remain optimistic in the midst of so much negative or, um, I guess, oppressive uh, histories? How do you remain optimistic? Uh, because you referenced a professor uh, that says when he writes about Puerto Rico, he gets so angry mm -hmm. because it almost seems as if nothing will change when you have all mm -hmm. of this information. So I'm curious as to how you remain optimistic. That's a hard one. Um, the and I, I say it's a hard one because it's one that I've wrestled with very concretely in terms of the traditions that inform my thinking. Um, because um, I draw a lot from traditions that are extremely critical um, in, in, the, in, the, in the sense of, um, of, the, of the negative, of, of, of surfacing uh, problems, questioning, um, and, but I'm also very influenced by traditions uh, that are committed to envisioning different futures. Um, and in, in, in this book I, I just finished, I was uh, f finding myself again and wondering why is it that I always end in these two? Um, and, and, and ended up, at least for now, thinking that I, that I need both, right? Uh, I need that, that to go back and forth between the very rigorous analysis of all that is wrong and all that, the, the ways in which uh, we continue to fail 
um, but also need those traditions to, to just risk envisioning uh, alternatives. Um, and, and all I can say is I need both. It's a question about family. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> it's a question about family. How has family influenced your scholarly voice uh, as well as your heritage? I mean, in this industry, it's more so a grind when it comes to producing papers of scholarship and staying in the early hours of the morning and your carol and things like that. What motivates you, Professor, about producing work and staying motivated when it comes to just being original? The, what, what motivates me is, is often the, I, I tend to write about things I see in the world very concretely, even if I write them, if I write about them kind of indirectly through theological language, through philosophical language. Um, and and it is often going back to that, going, reminding myself of why is it that I ever thought I could write a book about the body, and why, who cares, um, is, is going back to precisely to, to, to remind myself why. What are, what are the questions? Um, recently, I was, I was working on a, on a talk and was tired and, um, and needing that kind of energy to, to keep going. And, and I went through each one of my examples and tried to e imagine a concrete situation um, that related to that example. Um, and and that, that, that keeps me going. Any additional questions? Okay, well thank you. Thank you.